Now, of course, let's do a little history here. American conservatism has suffered ups and downs in the last 50 years or so since World War II ended. As a matter of fact, they seem on the edge of extinction after the crushing defeat of Barry Goldwater in 1964. People said that was the end of conservatism. After Reagan's failure to capture the Republican presidential nomination in 1976, people said, well, that's the end of Ronald Reagan. Now he's 65, it's time for retirement. And after Bill Clinton's third wave victory in 1992, we have to remember that it was 1992, what happened in 1994, just two years later, the contract with America? Every time conservatism rose from the ashes like the fabled phoenix. Well, today, the liberals are at it again, like Sam Tan and House, amnesiac as ever. They're saying that in the wake of last November's elections, American conservatism is headed for what? The ash heap of history. The country's no longer can America the conservative, asserted John Judas in the New Republic, but America the liberal. Barely able to contain herself, the editor of The Nation trumpeted that the election of Barack Obama marked the collapse of conservatism. Well, what's disturbing for me is not only these, these euphoric liberals, but the anxious conservatives who are ready to chart a new course even if they're uncertain about the direction. For example, the former congressman, Republican congressman, Nikki Edwards, no relation, has called for a return to what he calls the libertarian philosophy of Barry Goldwater. And we can talk a little bit about Barry Goldwater, whom I work for, and I wrote a book about. Edward says the villain behind the collapse of conservatism is the coupling of big government conservatives and what? The religious right. Hmm. George uh, Michael, Michael Gerson, a former Bush speechwriter, states that we need compassionate conservatism to confront what? Global AIDS, combat U.S poverty, and promote human rights abroad. Saying that conservatism without idealism is dead, he lists his heroes. Well, who are they? William Lloyd Garrison, William Jennings Bryan, Martin Luther King Jr., and John Paul II. Now, this is a quartet that is yet to make an appearance at the annual CPAC. <laughs> they say nothing of the Southern Baptist Convention. The commentator Patrick J. Buchanan lambasts arrogant neoconservatives and greedy Wall Streeters for leading us astray and sets forth an America First platform. It has some validity. Cato's David Boaz invokes a plague on both big government conservatives and big government liberals and says that choice is the key, whether you're choosing a church, a school, or a lifestyle. Now let's be clear about one thing. Republicans lost in 2008 and 2006, not because they ran on conservative ideas, but because they ran away from conservative ideas. So, what is to be done? That wonderful question, what is to be done? Well, I suggest that what is needed is a politics of inclusion, not exclusion. No casting out of social conservatives or neoconservatives or any other kind of conservative, but a renewed fusionism that will unite all the branches of the now divided conservative mainstream. I believe that a rejuvenated fusionism can do this. How? How? by blending the concepts of liberty and order, individual freedom and responsibility, limited government and a strong national defense, just as the Founding Fathers did with the checks and balances of the Constitution. Now, Frank Meyer, 
author of the original fusion of the back of the 1960s, an avowed libertarian, stated the core principle of his theory was, quote, that the freedom of the person is the central and primary end of political society. The freedom of the person, the individual, is the central and primary end of political society. The state has only three limited functions. National defense, the preservation of domestic order, and the administration of justice between citizens. But, Meyer argued, Religious and traditional precepts were now needed to undergird freedom, which could not exist on what? The relativist, materialistic premises of modern thought. In the American experience, he said, liberty and faith are joined, not separated, as the secularists have argued. Such a constitutional conservatism constitutional conservatism, in the words of my colleague Matthew Spaulding, will unite all conservatives through the natural fusion provided by American principles. How? Well, it will remind economic conservatives that morality is essential to limited government. Hayek said that. Adam Smith said that. Cultural conservatives, that unlimited government, is a threat to moral self-government. So don't look to government to solve your moral problems. And to national conservative, national security conservatives, that energetic but responsible conservatism and government is the key to the nation's well-being and proper place in the world. And I'm pleased to say that in about two weeks, in about a month, uh, Dr. Spaulding's book, is coming out, and I really, really recommend it to you. And as a matter of fact, Darren, maybe we can bring Matthew out here. He's a wonderful speaker. His book is called We Still Hold These Truths. You know where that comes from, right? We Still Hold, we hold These Truths. We, so he said the title is We Still Hold These Truths. It's a wonderful book, very accessible. It's not a heavy tone. And he talks not only about first principles, but how to apply those principles to the problems of today. So, how has conservatism survived these last 50 years, all the ups and downs that I've talked about? <clears throat> Was it luck? Divine intervention? Well, I, I believe in providence, but I also believe in free will. Maybe each conservative recovery was just simply part of the pendulum that Arthur Schlesinger Jr. has suggested dominates American politics. Swing left for a generation, then right, then right, then left, you know, ad infinitum. Or is the continuing durability of American conservatism due to the conscious acts of individual men and women operating on certain fundamental principles over the course of these last five decades. Here, I believe, lies the central reason for the viability of the conservative movement, guided by principles, such as limited constitutional government, keyword constitution, limited constitutional government, free enterprise, and traditional <clears throat> American values based on our Judeo-Christian heritage. 